welcome to Farm Sanctuary's first live sanctuary speaker series. My name is Nzinga Young and I'm the Senior Manager of Events and Experience here at Farm Sanctuary. It's my pleasure to bring you Barbara King and Jeff Vandermeer as our guests for today's discussion of Animals Best Friends, putting compassion to work for animals in captivity and in the wild. As we know, Barbara King is Emerita Professor of Anthropology at William & Mary, a freelance science writer and public speaker, the author of seven books, including the latest, Animals Best Friends. Barbara focuses on animal emotion and cognition, the ethics of our relationship with animals, and the evolutionary history of language, culture, and religion. Barbara will be in conversation with New York Times bestselling author Jeff Vandermeer. His novels include Dead Astronauts, Born, and the Southern Reach Trilogy, the first volume of which, Annihilation, won the Nebula Award and the Shirley Jackson Award and was adapted into a movie by Alex Garland. Jeff speaks and writes frequently about issues related to climate change as well as urban rewilding. Before we jump into their conversation, here's a brief overview of Animals Best Friends. Uh, as people come to understand more about animals' inner lives, we feel a growing compassion and a desire to better their lives. But how do we translate this compassion into helping those that are not our pets? Bringing together the latest science with heartfelt storytelling, Animals Best Friends reveals the opportunities we have in everyday life to help animals in our homes, in the wild, in zoos, and in science labs, as well as those considered to be food. This book is not of shaming and limitation, but of uplift and expansion. Though an animal expert, Barbara, like the rest of us, is still on a journey, learning each day how to do better and be better. By turning compassion into action on behalf of animals, we not only improve animals' lives, but we also immeasurably enrich our own. Lastly, there will be a Q&A segment at the end of the discussion. So please, as questions arise, click the Q&A button at the bottom of the Zoom window and we'll get to them at the end. All right, without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce Barbara King and Jeff Vandermeer. <laughs> Thank you so much. I appreciate that wonderful introduction and that wonderful uh, summation of this this amazing book, Animals Best Friends, uh, which I appreciated for the fact that it brings such clarity to such complexity without reducing the complexity. And that is so difficult to do in a book that is so eminently readable uh, and clear in what it has to say, and also, I think, forward thinking in its analysis. So, so first of all, thank you for that, uh, Barbara. And then also, I thought Maybe we would start small, as you do in the book, because you start talking about an encounter you had with a spider, uh, and you argue that spiders are a good example of an organism we often uh, react to reflexively. So could you talk a little bit about uh, how that encounter and spiders in general have kind of shaped some of your views on animals and uh, just about your relationship to spiders, perhaps? Sure, I'd love to start with spiders, but... I want to thank you, Jeff, first for that really kind introduction and also just for being here. I, sure. Your books have really exploded my, my brain in many ways, <laughs> in positive ways, and I'm happy to be here. And thank you as well to Farm Sanctuary, yeah. because, you know, um, Farm Sanctuary has been the leader in, in this field for 35 years, and it's just a great honor to be part of this speaker series. So thank you all. So in the book, I talk about a day, and this is many years ago now, when I was home alone in this house. Uh, my husband was out. Our only child at the time was living at home, but was also out. And I walked into the bathroom and I saw not one Jeff, but two spiders. <laughs> the doubling of those spiders, and I felt that they were large and that they were staring at me. And I just became highly reactive. And I took off my shoe. I beat them to death and I mm. down the toilet. And I have regretted that so much because, you know, what kind of animal person am I if I'm going to that to two defenseless spiders in my house? But it turns out that it became a real gateway for me because I decided that I needed to learn more about spiders and think about them. And that's kind of what Nzinga alluded to is that this book is about being on a journey 
And the spiders were very much part of my journey. So I started to read a little bit more about them and to try to observe them. And Nzinga, if you could please put up the spider slides, that would be helpful. These are the only three images that I'm going to show during this evening. But after this encounter with the two spiders in the house, on one day I was reading outside the house and this very small, and you have to admit pretty darn cute, jumping spider came onto my chair. And I just felt a sense of presence. This male or female was walking back and forth and looking at me clearly was aware of me. I was aware of the spider. And I did some reading and learned that saltacids, these jumping spiders, have a sense of numeracy. That is, they have a way to keep track of small numbers. And if I could please have the next slide. I also began to watch the spiders that in Virginia come out in August and September. These are orb weavers. And this is maybe a little less cute. And that's what I was challenging myself to do, to look and get to know this individual. And I ended up naming her Portia after a spider in a science fiction novel. And you can see that Portia here is having a pretty good lunch. So she set up right outside my study window and every day I could watch. I read about how spiders think with their webs, that it's part of them in the way that we might think of technology or computers as part of how we think. And overall, I just started to realize that they're part of that circle of, of animals that I want to be compassionate towards. So the last slide just shows me um, my favorite sign that my husband's ever made. Three words that I want on a t-shirt, don't bother spider. We had a spider across our porch and delivery people and so on were coming up. And we really, really wanted to protect, protect the small life. And I, I think for me, that's, that's really, Part of the challenge is not just to think about the lives of cats and dogs or elephants and orcas, but to really be aware of who is around us every day and, and think about how we might help them. Yeah, that's a really important thing. And uh, for, for me, uh, as the son of an entomologist, the spiders and whatnot are not the thing that I had to worry about being reflexive about its other things. So it's, it's, I think it's different for everyone. Yeah. I'm curious, what are some of the other daily kind of interactions the, with animals where you live and are they a source of joy and groundedness or is it more a more complex situation than that? Oh, the best days are the pure <laughs> days and they do exist. And I think that's part of the compassion picture that, I, that I'm drawing. So um, we live with seven cats and they're all rescued. And some of them have special needs. They're sometimes a bit difficult in terms of personality or had trauma in their lives and just eat constantly because they don't really trust the food source will still be yeah. there. We had a cat recently with a very extremely complex femur fracture. And so they're of course part of our family and when their days are good, our days are good and, and so forth. But during the pandemic, I had what almost sounds like a stereotypical experience, but it was amazing for me as I opened up to the world of birds in my yard. And, you know, just something as simple as putting out water on hot days, making sure that there's food during the time of the day when they need it most or during migration periods. Of course, trying to ensure that some of the plants in the yard will be good for pollinators, birds and bees. And all of that has has made my life just threaded through you know, with animals. And so what I try to do is think about how to take that, that joy that I feel and in a way scale it up and think about animals that I can't see in, in front of me. And sometimes the situations that we think about with animals are, are difficult, they're tough, they're hard to think about, they make us sad, but it is the, from the platform of that joy and groundedness that we can do that and, and refresh ourselves. So every single day for me is an animal day. And, and one more question just about your yard, because we share something in common and that we both have box turtles in our yards. And for me during the pandemic, I learned more about box turtles, which was a little horrifying for me just because 
Um, there have been a couple situations where I've had to pick up a box turtle to help it in some way, mm -hmm. um, especially like one that was on the road. And I didn't realize that you really need to, I mean, I think I picked them up from the bottom, so, but I didn't realize how their skeleture is, how, how much they feel uh, mm -hmm. through their shell. Um, so there were things like that. And I was curious, you know, I find myself projecting things onto the box turtles because they're so unlike us. And I try to stop myself because I know I'm anthropomorphizing, but what is your relation with the box turtles? Do you find yourself doing that? Uh, do you know a lot about box turtles? How do you? Well, really, but what the yeah. excitement has been the ability to recognize them as individuals. Mm -hmm. There were five individuals just yeah. crossing our yard, you know, reappearing. Um, and I can often tell who's a male and who's a female, had a spectacular mating event that we filmed <laughs> while we were watching them. Um, so, you know, I'm aware of a little bit of what they need in terms of mm -hmm. and the ability to borrow and the fact that, you know, you don't want to relocate them. Of course, mm -hmm. the road, yes. But what we're, I think, fairly good at doing is trying to look and see, you know, what is the goal of this turtle? Mm -hmm. What direction is he or she going? So, mm -hmm a little bit in that sense in terms of navigation mm -hmm. i project and bring them strawberries and blueberries <laughs> but but other than that i i just want them to feel to, to feel safe and i don't know what that means to mm -hmm. but you know they they appear they let us come close mm -hmm. not necessarily pull their heads in either when we mm -hmm. come close now so mm -hmm. i do sometimes imagine that they have sense that we're not going to rush at them unless they're in immediate danger yeah. of the roadway. Yeah, I do find if, if you move slowly, um, and I don't think they can really be habituated by occasional food, which is also something that's good. So yeah, um, definitely occasional. In yeah. fact, I learned from people that I was overfeeding our yard rabbits. Oh, um, really? <laughs> so excited about how they enthusiastically received the bounty of carrots that I was giving. Someone said, you know, there's way too much sugar. You should not be doing mm. And so sometimes I do get a little bit into trouble because of course I'm not wanting to do this for me. I'm wanting to do this for them. So I have to yeah. be careful. Yeah, no, I totally get that. So um, another section of your, your, your book, Roaming a Little Farther Afield, uh, is about wild or wilder animals. And, you know, I think this is kind of topical, but also maybe is also a problem that's been around for a while. It's just it came to our attention because of the, the overload. And that is the stress on animals that are kind of overvisited national parks. And so I was curious, how do we get people to infringe less on wild places while still engaging their empathy. I mean, I per I would be perfectly fine with going to a national park and finding that there's just one trail I can go on and that's it. Um, but I'm a little weird that way. I, I actually want less access for everyone <laughs> rather than more. So I'm curious if you would like to talk a little bit about that and, and that chapter in your book. Yeah, I have so loved going to Yellowstone National Park multiple times and became totally smitten with bison and was mm very surprised, I guess, naively to, to see with my own eyes, people who would rush out towards the bison as if they were in some kind of Disney movie, little kids. And one time there was a bus where people, a tourist bus, people poured out of the bus down a slope towards the bison. I just couldn't believe what I was seeing. So, you know, the park rangers are there, you know, don't get closer than in 25 feet. There's all kinds of pamphlets. And so if they're not succeeding, I'm not sure that I know how we succeed, except to really get across the idea that wild means wild. And I would be very happy if there were more trail shutdowns. Um, there are a couple of areas in my home state of New Jersey and also here in Virginia where when birds or turtles are nesting, popular beaches, popular trails are shut down. I'm sure it's the same in Florida. I think that reminds people that part of what we can do is to still ourselves, be quiet, give wild animals space. And in a bizarre way, I think these viral videos of you know, people getting tossed by bison or you know, have elk rushing at them is, is a way I share them. I share them and I use Twitter hashtags, you know, don't be a jerk to wildlife. Just really talking about this and having people remember that respect often means doing absolutely nothing. Don't encroach on their territory any more than we already have. 
Do you think part of the problem is a, a connection with nature that's no longer there or, or misinformation in terms of too many representations of animals in like pop culture and whatnot that, that kind of distort what a wild animal is? Yeah, I think it's the latter. I think it's it is. distortion uh, in a lot of ways. I mean, I don't know if you've had the experience of people coming, you know, to your ravine or your yard, mm. just not being able, even a good person not being able to be quiet, just using mm. a voice and large movements and large gestures. And I think that part of our education of kids could be very much about this, mm. about how we separate out what are these alluring images in cartoons and movies from the way that one acts around real animals. You know, I was trained in Amboseli National Park to follow baboons for a year. And it is a very fast education because if you're not good at what you're doing in terms of economy of emotion and stillness, they leave. And that is the same way really in the yard, the birds leave if I don't know how to do this. So I think that simply talking about there are social values that we use in our communities, how we act around each other, and we, you know, teach kids inside voices and outside voices, a parallel set of instructions of how to be around animals would be really, really helpful. Yeah, and um, I, I have to admit that I, I did, <laughs> I usually vet people before I go on long hikes with them, but I didn't once, uh, and I had the experience of going on a 12-mile hike with someone who was very loud the entire time, and, and uh, <laughs> It was very difficult to uh, to have that experience and be polite. Uh, and at one point, I had to not be polite, but it still didn't really uh, register. So, um, the other thing I wanted to ask you about before we leave this topic is: What do you think about the growing momentum for the idea of striving to preserve thirty percent of the world in some approximation of a wild uh, wild uh, state? Yeah, I think thirty percent is good, or Ed Wilson's fifty percent is good. I also really want to emphasize that, you know, preserving public lands, public landscapes, wild places, wild parks is really super important. And, I, and, you know, I don't know how we could be against that, but what I'm really, really wanting to convey is the idea of the small patches of land that we live in or our college campuses are, are on, our corporate parks are on even, our balconies, everything, that has to be part of the effort. So, because I'm not a conservationist and I'm, I'm interested in, but not very knowledgeable about these big, big projects, the part that I really want to get into is, you know, how we can just change our everyday environment because even 30% is not going to do it. And we could increase that percentage just dramatically by all contributing again to, you know, the right plants, safe environments, all that stuff. It's kind of the irony that the way that we've set up our cities and the fact that we have suburbs with large, you know, lots uh, mm -hmm. creates this kind of inequality to some degree. And now it's actually the place where <laughs> nature survives mm -hmm. because we've destroyed the idea of the commons, so to speak. The thing I find in Tallahassee that's particularly distressing is that we have these easements or these like green spaces full of mm -hmm. trees between, say, businesses or you know whatever and those are the places that are now getting uh, attacked and so I feel like in addition to the things you mentioned these places that seem like they're just something between destinations need to be carefully looked at and, and preserved and not just thought of as throwaway or things that can be developed because we're losing a lot of those as well. So in the book, you analyze the issues with zoos, uh, you know, which I think a, a lot of us are, are, are familiar with at this point, which is a good thing. I think that, that they're, you know, you bring up some things that I, I don't think are as obvious, uh, but I, you also discuss the value of animal sanctuaries when animals can't be returned to the wild. So my initial question is just, do you consider a habitat like Bush Gardens, which I visited, I think 20 years ago, and I, I do remember a fairly vast landscape relative to zoos but uh do you consider bush gardens a place like that i know you talk about this in the book a sanctuary for animals i don't <laughs> um i have frequently visited bush gardens here because we're so near williamsburg virginia and i know there's also one in, in florida bush gardens has gotten a lot better from the days when there were small dingy cages for primates and every spring there would be a new crop of baby animals of whatever species, it was so eerie. You know, you leave in September and the animals had grown up a little bit and you come back in May and there's babies again. And that's just not the way you educate anyone about anything. 
But um, the, the one good thing I could say is that some of the animals at Bush Gardens are rescued and rehabilitated. So they're not, for example, able to fly. There are four eagles here who could not possibly fly. And I think that that moves you slightly in the direction of a sanctuary. But clearly the idea here is human entertainment so that the animals always have to be close up and visible and on display. And I tell a story in the book about the day that I went to see some wolves at Bush Gardens and I noticed there was a little bit of blood on the muzzle of one of them. And there was a quite frantic employee talking into the walkie talkie saying, you know, this is terrible. There's, there's blood on the, on the muzzle of this wolf. This wolf ate a rodent. We have to get him off exhibit. And that's because you can't possibly show a carnivore being a carnivore when you're not a sanctuary. It's about the, the face of entertainment and fairly, you know, scrubbed entertainment at that. So while I give marks to bush gardens for some things, I certainly don't put them in the sanctuary category. So how much of a sanctuary is dependent on the philosophy behind the organization as opposed to just room to roam? Everything, just everything. So, you know, if you have zoos, that, just that very word, putting animals on exhibit, mm -hmm. also the case for bush gardens, is very jarring to me because it is, it becomes sort of this, you know, pan optical moment where you could see everything that this animal is doing. And the big advance sort of in a zoo is to have a bush or something where the animal can get away from the human gaze. And in good sanctuaries, and of course we're here in the speaker series of one of them, the idea is that the animals themselves are always primary and their needs are primary. And the human is second. The human is not part of the picture in the same way at all. And that is much, much harder to accomplish than it may sound, I believe. Because when you have, you know, what is it, 800 animals at the Watkins Glen Farm Sanctuary property, and you're making sure that the animals' lives are what come first and not the human gaze, it takes an amazing amount of commitment. And I would also say that I learned through some distressing experiences that simply having sanctuary in the name of an organization is not, you know, is not enough to know what's, what's happening. So going to Farm Sanctuary in Watkins Glen, going to the Center for Great Apes in Washula, Florida, the real deal. You can see it and you can hear it and you can tell mm -hmm. philosophy. It's the same thing with wildlife rescue places. I was absolutely shocked to Google stuff online. You know, we have a great one locally, St. Francis, that does all the things correctly. When I Google things online, I find advice from wildlife uh, rescue places that's absolutely false about like how you feed baby squirrels and stuff. It's, it's really remarkable to me, the variation. So I can only imagine with sanctuaries. But you did have a, a chance to visit the sponsor of this event. You talk about that a little bit in the book, uh, Farm Sanctuary in Watkins Glen. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about that experience? I know you do in the book, but if you could just oh, give us some. I'd love to. I have so many good memories of coming to Farm Sanctuary. I was invited to speak um, in August at the Sanctuary Weekend some years ago, but I really wanted to go to look and listen and learn, and that's exactly what happened. So one of my favorite set of memories was standing at the sheep and goat barn, and I don't even know how to put into words. It's such an amazing place because there are animals that are just running freely and I you know, and I'm going to anthropomorphize joyfully because you can tell it's not really anthropomorphizing. Just up and back, there's a barn with shelter. There's all kinds of goats and sheep around. I saw one goat wearing braces. In other words, this is bringing forward that notion where it's a place where the animals themselves set the tone, make decisions, set the pace. So some animals wanted to come up to the very few human visitors who were there. In fact, on the jacket of my book, I have a picture of <laughs> Cynthia Goat, whom I met at the <laughs> in Sheep Barn. And she wanted you know, pets and caresses and other animals didn't. And it was all their choice. Every animal was valued. Every animal had a friend, whether it would be an animal friend, mostly occasionally a human friend. And this was multiplied by the cows and the sheep and the turkeys and the chickens. And so I felt that it was a moment to see for myself, not just read about or watch a video about, but watch in three dimensions what it's like for the animals to express themselves in sanctuary. And I mm. saw that. It was great. Yeah, I was going to say too that I, I think something that's undervalued, uh, but I see it even in rewilding our yard. 
uh, the farm sanctuary has been around for 35 years. That consistency, I think, is incredibly important. Uh, that stability is incredibly important. But I was wondering if you had a chance to sum it up, not just your visit, but just in terms of thinking about an organization, thinking about farm sanctuary, what's the power of a sanctuary like this one? Uh, yes, I have a large cat coming up to the screen. But I... <laughs> okay. Yes, um, the power of the sanctuary is, is a very important question. And I think it starts for me with the concept of safety. Hmm. Because sanctuary means physical safety, emotional safety, psychological safety for vulnerable beings. And we know that the world can be a tough place. And we know that with industrial agriculture, it's a really tough place for farmed animals. So the example that I gave a minute ago of meeting a goat wearing braces was just so meaningful to me because here is an animal that would have been in other spheres be considered imperfect disposable. And of course, not at all in sanctuary. This animal was seen as intrinsically valuable. The other thing I would say is that it's wonderful to be in sanctuary because the animals are not symbolic and they're not there for humans. They're not symbols of anything. They're flesh and blood animals who are given space in every sense of the word space to express their desires. But at the same time, the property, the landscape, the physical place of the sanctuary is symbolic of a world that I think could be very different and recognize that you know, the world wasn't made for us. And, and I talk a lot as an anthropologist about this concept of human exceptionalism, the idea that humans are somehow more complicated, better or superior, you know, our language is better, our tools are better, our society is better. And I push back against that, I resist that, and that's exactly what sanctuary does. It makes you see that human exceptionalism misses the point. It's kind of a glimpse of a better future for all of us in a way, I would say. Exactly. Um, I would also just add that I, uh, for those who are, are, are watching and listening, that I donated $200 to farmsanctuary.org today, and it was quick and remarkably easy, and I highly recommend uh, doing so at whatever level makes sense for you. Uh, and now, uh, this feels like a good time to ask if you'd like to read from the book and give readers a sense of it while your cat uh, comes on stage behind you. <laughs> okay, I'm going to set this up a little bit. I wanted to read a passage about a, a farm animal. And this um, passage, I'm, I'm opening it up discussing that I've just flown into the Midwest to give a keynote at a conference to talk about animal grief and love. And before that happened, and there's the cat, I decided to go and take a walk with a friend, a drive with a friend to spend some time with animals that were on campus. So driving down a rough road, we arrived at the university's horse farm. We got out and stood by its fence to take in the view. Foals snuggled up to their mothers. Juvenile males kicked up their heels in playful mock fighting. The sun glinted off the horse's chestnut colored coats. All in all, the picture was one of joyful movement and relaxed socializing. Here was exactly the animal high that I had sought, indeed that I routinely seek. If I'm at a party, I look for the dog or cat. If I'm traveling, I seek a good spot to encounter local wildlife. And now my friend and I found a few moments of equine bliss. Driving further along into the agricultural school section of this campus, we came upon a sign marking the dairy cattle research area. My eye caught sight of a cow, but my brain couldn't immediately make sense of the image before me because a large, clear, ring-shaped window was embedded in the cow's side. The ring looked like an ocean liner's porthole, transparent and able to be pulled open by a person. Down the cow's flank seeped a kind of liquid discharge. Placidly, the cow chewed her food as she stood next to a, quote, normal cow with no portal. Under a blue July sky, no other humans within sight or sound, the scene took on an eerie feel. Who was this cow? To what use in dairy research was she put? At that point, my mind was stuffed with thoughts of animal joy and grief, the subject of my talk. And I couldn't help but wonder, what did this cow experience when people reached through the portal into the very depths of her body? And I learned through doing some research that this particular cow that I saw was called Brooke. 
that she was well known on campus, that there are hundreds of cows like this in this country and more across the world, and they were called fistulated cows. And the portal is there so that veterinary teachers can teach students by having them put their hands in the body. It is also there because some of that, the stuff that's being sort of, you know, churned up in that bacterial vat of the cow's stomach can be taken out and given to a sick cow for a sort of transplantation help to an ill cow. But a few pages later, I just want to read two more sentences um, because I think that that day really changed my thinking in, in a number of ways. The construction of Brooke as a fussed over cow exists on a continuum with stylized drawings of smiling cows who grace signs outside barbecue restaurants. So there were all these articles about how, you know, Brooke was basically a Clara Barton of cows and had this wonderful life. And I got to think about when you, you know, go to a restaurant, you know, I don't eat animals, I don't eat barbecue, but when you see these depictions of, of happy cows and happy pigs, it's just quite off-putting. These depictions are created to strengthen the notion that a surface story is true. These animals are okay with what happens to them and these events occur humanely. And of course we know that they don't occur humanely and that animals are mm -hmm. suffering. I have been getting a message that I have to change a, a battery up here. So let me just say that, um, that part of, of what this made me realize is that there was such a metaphor there of, of, of transparency that we could see into this cow's body. But for the most part, you know, certainly industrial agricultural is not transparent about what happens to animals. And animals kept in laboratories, the biomedical research community is not transparent about what happens to animals. And so I just really wanted to play with that and to say, that greater awareness of this stuff that happens can give us opportunities to speak up and to do better and be better for these animals that are caught up in these huge systems, but we can play a part in that, in, in helping, fighting against that. Yeah, and one thing that struck me was how you uh, had information on how pain management for those cows differs uh, greatly uh, and, and also is often, uh, rather inadequate after the operation, at least it seemed, seemed to me. Uh, and then also the, the, the PR aspect that you're mentioning, uh, this kind of need uh, to make the cows, uh, make it seem like the cows are happy. This, uh, you mentioned uh, in the book, something about a kind of a holy cow campaign, which is truly tasteless in my opinion, um, about how the cow is happy to be of help and leading a great life and everything. And- uh, this On that holy, right? The whole- right. The yeah, spiritualness supposedly of this helper cow. It was just too much. Yeah, and it, it strikes me that that uh, a lot of uh, a lot of time and thought and, and a sadly imagination is put into creating these things, these walls around the things that we do to animals, so that we can kind of live with the thought of it. <laughs> um, and I'm just curious, you know, you know. Do you, when you walk around in your daily lives, do you, in your daily life, do you see what you consider propaganda about animals everywhere you go? I mean, is it just that rife through society? And then also, what is, what kinds or what types of propaganda about animals do you think are most insidious or just invisible to most people? I, I do see it everywhere from the idea that you know, we should go entertain ourselves by watching orcas kept in swamp mm. jump around for us. And that is because, you know, they're happy to perform for us to, you know, I'm, I'm really thinking quite a lot about animals in laboratories because what you find, and here is another example of propaganda that first of all, that we need these animals to make ourselves healthy by say drug testing or experimentation. And that there's this incredible, supposedly ethical overlay for all of these experiments so that, you know, there's nothing really that bad happening because everybody cares about the animals. And if you do the research, I will tell you, at the university level, at the federal level, these labs do not have good ethical oversight, but the research community is absolutely invested and you see it. If you go to different web pages, 
you see mice sort of in a gloved hand or you know a monkey sort of you know cavorting in a cage and it's absolutely meant to keep us from asking questions and there, there's one study that I wanted to mention uh, that was done in America where two sets of participants were told a story about tree kangaroos and in one story tree kangaroos live in New Guinea period in the other story, tree kangaroos live in New Guinea and get eaten. And the only difference was that between these two groups. And the participants who heard that tree kangaroos got eaten immediately judged them as less capable of suffering and uh, less deserving of our moral concern. And that's exactly what you know, the meat industry, the industrial ag industry wants. They want us to not look at the animals that we eat. And yet, you know, you go to Farm Sanctuary and hang out with the cows, the pigs, the chickens, and they are so profoundly thinking and feeling, and you see that, but that has, there has to be a veil over that, you know, and of course, many of us here in this audience are resisting that, and that's a good thing. And, and uh, I just wanted to point out that you have an essay in Psyche uh, Online, uh, in, in part about what you just talked about, about the false dichotomy of of how animals, for example, are, are seen as a necessary sacrifice uh, to cure cancer when in fact the data indicates that a lot of this research is completely uh, useless. And, and, and you know, you see that even in, I remember having a horrible college biology class where they dissected a frog, you know, and it's like, why are, why are, we, why are we all doing this? <laughs> this? This weird ritual that isn't actually uh, doing a whole lot for anybody and definitely not for the, the frogs involved. <laughs> Um, just seems completely pointless. So one thing I always ask myself, and it's a very kind of a crude indicator, I don't know that it always applies, but I always ask myself in a situation when I'm thinking about the non-human, if this was happening to a human being, would it be okay? And, and the, the, the flashpoint for me was there was this video uh, shared of this otter in a zoo with a little, it was in a little uh, glass cage with two little holes so it could reach out and shake hands. Mm -hmm. And all these people were sharing it as the cutest thing ever. Mm -hmm. And to me, it was absolutely horrifying. And, and you see this phenomenon in a lot of the videos that are shared about animals worldwide on social media is that they're actually horrifying if you really think about what's going on uh, in choices. So do you ask yourself similar questions? Do you, since the spider incident, for example, and the reflexivity of that, you know, do you feel like you sometimes have to be on guard? I mean, you, you know more than a lot of us about these things, so maybe you don't anymore. I still feel like I have to be. On guard because there's so much that's deceptive? Or yeah, that, 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 that there's so much, and there's so much in the, in the, the monoculture that, yes. that uh, harms animals even without realizing it, I guess. Oh, yes, okay. Well, frequently I am sent... Um, cross-species friendship videos where you will mm. see, for example, an orangutan feeding um, tiger cubs. And it turns out that this quote unquote sanctuary is extremely exploitative of these mm. particular individuals. And mm -hmm. I know that because I know the history of the sanctuary, which is not a sanctuary. So then I wonder what don't I know? Mm -hmm. That makes me very wary. So now Really, before I share anything, go anywhere, recommend anything, I try to do a lot of research. And that is that is helpful. But yes, I'm very guarded. And you know, the whole question of, of realizing my work has, has involved so much about animal emotions, mm. about their ability, many animals, to feel love and to feel grief, that I kind of have to walk a line here because if people come back at me and say, oh, you're anthropomorphizing and you're projecting, my answer is absolutely not. Because what I'm doing is looking scientifically at the visible cues that animals show us um, that I have a you know, good definition of what animal grieving looks like. I look for that and I see it. And so my answer is here the animal is telling us something from his or her own actions and we have to open our eyes and see them. So it's only anthropomorphic in that situation if we think that love and grief is entirely human, right? Because anthropomorphism is projecting human qualities. But if it's not actually human to begin with, then it can't be anthropomorphic. So I want to be able to say, you know, don't get too, too worried about anthropomorphism when it's scientifically grounded, but then you have to really worry about this other stuff, which is, is you know, sort of packaged cuteness when you don't know the source of it. So there's that balance I'm trying to achieve. Yeah. 
And, and that's a really good point about animal emotion and grief, because one of the more horrific experiences I had in that context, knowing, you know, having read some of your work and read other people's work is an essay in Harper's just three years ago by someone who should have known better with the central argument was only humans can really experience grief or <laughs> these kinds of emotions. And then went on from there. And it was just like, why is this stuff not fact checked? Um, so I'm curious, I have a couple more questions and then we're going to take questions from the audience. Uh, so please do get them in in the Q&A uh, section at the bottom of your screen. But can you tell us a little bit about reactions to your writings about animals? Do you sometimes hear of big changes in readers or is it mostly smaller incremental steps? What, what, what is the reader feedback like? One thing I love is when people write me and say, I read your octopus chapter, this is the previous book, and I'm never going to eat an octopus again. Um, among my other very, very favorite invertebrates, in addition to spiders, yes. octopus. And unfortunately, they are a candidate for aquaculture now. Ugh. In fact, it's a disaster. It's like replicating <sighs> the factory farm. Yeah. And it's just wrong for so many reasons. But but the, the point is that, you know, when I talk about this, my, my suggestion is, okay, we know that octopus are really smart and we know that they flash their moods on their skin. Those are all great reasons not to eat them, but that's not the only reasons we shouldn't eat them. We don't want to end up having this human standard of, oh, we're only going to be kind to animals who are like us or who we can recognize are smart and thinking. And when people get that and they write to me about that and they say, you know, it's not just because octopus can solve problems and use tools. I just don't want to eat them anymore or with pigs or with cows. It's extremely, it's just uplifting and it's just wonderful. And then I get, I, I will tell a story about being on stage um, at the New York Science, um, the, the World Science Festival in New York. Mm -hmm. And there was another panelist who actually said to me in front of many hundreds of people that I had embellished a story to make a point about animal emotions. And scientists get very nervous in some cases, not all, but in some cases, when you are freely throwing around words like love and grief for animals, there's a real bifurcation. I have lots and lots of colleagues who, you know, predated me and taught me things about animal emotion, and I am part of this community. But there's still many who are very threatened by that idea. And I wonder, is it not because they have to use animals in, in research? And it's pretty inconvenient to know that they have these emotions. Yeah, I mean, I expressed that just as a single line in a presentation, and the person who had invited me actually came down afterwards and says, said something along the lines of, do you want to just do away with the Enlightenment, which seemed an odd overreaction. <laughs> but um, So we are going to go to audience questions in this section, but I am going to put you on the spot uh, in kind of a speed round. I know you don't believe in any kind of hierarchy of animals, and I don't either, but I'm going to ask you to choose between two different animals. There's a couple sets of these and tell us why you would choose one over the other, okay? okay. Are you ready? Are you prepared? I'm ready. Okay. Wolf spider or box turtle? Wolf spider because I owe them everything. Those are the <laughs> spiders I killed. Le leech or nurse shark? Oh, nurse shark. <laughs> I have to, I'm gonna have to admit to you, to you, sharks are cool. Okay. Raccoon or raccoon dog? Oh, raccoon, uh, manipulative, fascinating. They're absolutely difficult in our yard sometimes, but we love them. They break into everything. I thought this would be more difficult for you, Barbara, but <laughs> obviously not. And the last one before we go to the audience questions, cow or another cow? <laughs> <laughs> yes, every cow. I embrace every cow, including all okay. the cows at Farm Sanctuary. I opened my book, you know, very first page is in the cow barn at Farm yeah. Sanctuary. All those cows are the cows I choose. Yeah, <laughs> thought you would say that. Okay, so we're going to go to audience questions, and we seem to have quite a few, so give me a second here. Sure. Um, well, let's just go to this. What do you feed your cats? I know dogs can be vegan, but I understand cats cannot. Cats are obligate carnivores and we feed them what we ourselves don't eat in this house. And it is, we feed them, you know, the yeah. uh, cat food. And I really dislike thinking about what's in that cat food because I know what's in that cat food. But if you're going to have cats, the things that I say are, first of all, keep them inside. You know, we don't want them out there eating birds and wildlife. And secondly, feed them the way that they were evolved to be fed. So we don't, you know, feed our cats vegan food, you know. 
Do you worry that solutions like plant-based and cultured meats allow us to not address the underlying issues you discuss regarding how we perceive our relationship to animals? Great question. You know, I've not eaten animals for quite a while now, and I have a refrigerator in the next room full of non-dairy and plant-based food. Uh, I, I'm very, very, very close to, to vegan at this point, almost all my meals. And I think that that has made me feel closer to the issues of animal agriculture rather than, than more distant. I understand the point of the question, but I got there by informing myself about why it was important to do this. And you know, in the book I do say, and this is really no surprise to anyone, the single best thing we can do for animals at this point is eat plants. Cultured meat, I know people are reactive to both in plant-based community and without. I think I was more concerned in the first years when plant-based meat was incorporating, say, fetal bovine serum, but mm -hmm. the companies have moved beyond that to a certain degree. And if you hear a person say, I don't want to eat that dirty lab meat, I ask, what the heck do you think you're eating when you're eating meat? So I think that we need you know, all the solutions together and that they can close that gap because we know we are doing things for animals rather than distancing ourselves from animals. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, another question, uh, how can we encourage a sense of connection between human, uh, humans and other species without encouraging or allowing close contact? Yes, I think that there's so much wonderful things happening now with VR, virtual reality technology, that can convey so much about who animals are. You know, of course, we've had amazing documentary movies all along, but I think VR in some ways is going to be a game changer. I have myself experienced VR movies about animals. But I also think we want people to be in nature. We want them out there. So it just has to be an understanding that you don't go to a national park because you are human and you own that park. There has to be much, much more education about you're entering another animal's habitat. I mean, of course, you know, I bet this house is built on animal's habitat. We always are in animal's habitat. And to really, really think about that. So um, here's a question. Even with compassion and care for all beings, aren't there life situations where we have to sadly kill animals that cause harm and negative impacts, such as bed bugs or wasps? I would just add that I have never killed a wasp in my life and never had a need to, but, but what, what would you say to that? I don't kill wasps either, but I will say that this is also a good question, and I want to answer it in two different ways. I have developed really a sense that What's important is being aspirational about not wanting to harm animals because there's no way that we can live harming animals. What I eat harms animals. I mean, I eat a lot of fruits and vegetables, non-dairy stuff, and I know that I'm not escaping the harm of animals because agriculture just does kill animals and you know small animals out in the fields, whatever. But I also have had a tick-borne illness twice in Africa. I had malaria. I see ticks in my house, I do not rescue them. I feel that there has to be, to some degree, a sense of public health concern as well, so that there has to be some degree of balance. And I think that an understanding that we cannot live without harming other animals is at once both sad, but is also a motivator to try to do so you know, as little as possible and understanding that we don't have to be grief stricken because it just is the way of the world. We just have to try each to our own circumstance and ability. And certainly as an anthropologist, I understand global inequalities and we're not all going to be able to enter this equation in the same place, but just, you know, wh what is amazing is how many people are trying. This is what I respect, that we're in this together, that we're a community, that we want to reward each other for doing these positive things and that we can feel joy. And before we end, I do want to say one more thing about joy, but. <laughs> okay, I'll try to make a note of that then. Um, there's so many great questions here. It's actually making it difficult. Um, uh, uh, can you, I don't, know, I don't know if I necessarily agree with the premise of the question, but uh, can you talk about the harshness of life in the wild and the role of compassion for predatory animals? 
Okay, well, predatory animals are not being aggressive and they're not being, they're not carrying out, you know, murder. They're evolved to do what they do. And there's a huge, huge amount of discrimination against predators that really, really concern me in this country. For example, wolves. We only have to look at what happened this past winter in the West with the indiscriminate killing of far too many wolves. So I want to make clear that, you know, we humans kill other animals in, in a, a very um, unusual way. Um, predators are not doing what, what we are doing. They're just being who they are. So I think that in some ways, um, you know, nature is harsh. I mean, there's sometimes when I looked at Portia, the spider who I described to you as having this web outside my window and I kind of, you know, had a little crush on Portia for the two months she was around. And, you know, she would get these, these beautiful insects and eat them. And it was hard, you know, but I'm not going to take an insect out of the web. I am not going to, um, you know, try to stop um, any anything that's going on naturally in, in my yard. It's just that that's the way that life evolved. And so there's so much going on that we are doing that I would rather put the emphasis on how we can stop, you know, all the problems that we are creating, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, and this is... Uh, 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 another, I think, a, not a difficult question, but it, it is definitely a question that I think some people uh, would not like to know the answer to. Is there a way to eat meat and still be a legitimate animal rights supporter? I will say that I, I can't see that for myself, mm -hmm. but I do have a section in the book where I talk about this marvelous book by Sonora Taylor, who writes about how wrong it is to judge people who say, I can't eat a plant-based diet because of a disability. In other words, there are people who can't eat the way they might wish to eat because of their body rebels, they, they simply can't, or perhaps a disability uh, makes it impossible for them to choose the meals and prepare the meals that they would want. And, and my point here is, is um, I do consider myself in some ways after cancer treatment uh, to be disabled in, in some of the ways that I function in the world. And I think we all are disabled at one point in another in our lives. That's just one example. But I, I think that it's very important not to have complete purity tests all the time for who is the best friends to animals. I admire vegans tremendously. I've learned so much from them, but part of what vegans tell me is that being compassionate should extend to other people. And this is something that I saw in action at Farm Sanctuary, who Farm Sanctuary is welcoming to people coming through the door, whether they are vegan or not vegan. So this is a roundabout way of answering the question. Um, I think it's imperative for all of us to cut back as much as we possibly can on meat, dairy, and seafood. But that might look a little different depending on what community you're in, what country you're in, what disability community you're in. And I think that's the best way I can answer it. Okay. We have a, uh, time for a couple more questions, but I'm not going to forget about the joy at the very end. Uh, but someone mentions uh, <laughs> having enjoyed and somehow taken hope from the fact that you and I have become friends on Twitter and would love to know more about how that came about. And as usual, as I get older, I forget things. So Barbara, I feel like I've known you a very long time, even though I haven't, I, and I've never met you, but um, I can't really recall how that came about in the first place. Well, I'll, this kind of actually plays into joy for me because in one of your presentations uh, on Zoom, it might've been for Hummingbird Salamander recently, I don't know, you mentioned how people come to your work from all different angles. Some people come from your books or Eilish in the movie and then your books or from Wilding hashtag on Twitter. And I came to your work through Dead Astronauts. And that book was, I, I can't even describe how it just made me think in such an amazingly different way about animals. And so I reviewed it and I reviewed Born. That's right, yeah. For Weekly Magazine. And I had been following you for a while, but I think that's when we actually began to intersect. Mm -hmm. Began to realize that first of all, I wanted to keep reading you, but I also wanted to keep following you because every single day, a million <laughs> photos and, uh, and videos. So people, if you're not following Jeff Vandermeer, hashtag rewilding, right? Uh, uh, Vanderwild, but yeah, it's, that doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't matter. But the thing I wanted to say about joy is that there's a reason why 
the single epigraph in my book is joy only reminds you why we fight. That's from Dead Astronauts, that's your line. It's because it says everything to me. It is, I mean, what we're talking about here is how difficult some things are in this world when we want to help animals. But the joy is there and the joy is so important because it's the whole foundation for what all of us in this community get up every day. When it's hard, when it's easy, whatever the day, it's because we want that joy, not just for ourselves, but for all beings in the world. And so I just want to thank you for that whole sentence and the whole book because <laughs> it was amazing. Well, thank you for your book, which is, is pretty amazing too. And I think we've run out of time for yeah. questions. Unfortunately, there are so many questions. Uh, but in closing, I just was wondering where you would place Animal's Best Friend in the context of your other work, uh, if you, you have a moment to just briefly uh, address that. It's a logical extension for me of my other two books with the University of Chicago. And shout out to my publishers with a thank you. <laughs> How Animals Grieve was um, a pretty personal book in some ways. I was grappling with understanding animal grief and love. The next one, Personalities on the Plate, The Lives and Minds of Animals We Eat, was a little more personal. But this one, Animals Best Friends, is, is much more trying to understand and grapple with these questions through the way that my own life has turned out. And it is across so many different contexts. So it is what I think of as an amplification and an explosion of science storytelling that came before to say, look, okay, we know the science now. The animals are waiting, you know, let's get with it. And I also wanted to say that I really am active on Twitter. So if people have questions that they did not get to ask, I'm very happy to answer them either through my website, barbarajking.com, or on Twitter, which is bjkingape. If you just identify yourselves as having a question from tonight, I'll get back to you. And I think we can fit in one more just, just to, to kind of end on something I think is really uh, interesting because your book is really about communicating a lot of these issues and and I, I know I struggle with this this question too uh, even in talking to the neighbors sometimes do you have advice on how to educate enlighten friends and family on everything we know about the plight of animals when there seems to be so much to communicate and so many issues and thus the risk of overwhelming them and or losing the poignancy of the overall issue of animal compassion do you have any advice or words to address that I would say focus on individual storytelling. And by that, I mean, talk about not the plight of octopuses in aquaculture. Talk about Inky the octopus who escaped from a zoo. Talk about the octopus that you met somewhere as I was able to meet an octopus and, and have him touch my skin and, and taste me. But if you don't know octopus, that's fine. Um, go to Farm Sanctuary's website and look at the video of Curly the Steer. Because if you talk about animal grief, and you look at that video, it brings the whole thing right into immediate focus. And just, I think, make it, you know, real in terms of individual animals' lives rather than big, big abstracts. Talk about the pig that you're not eating and why, anything along those lines. And I would add, uh, find some kind of a local connection if you possibly can. Something that really ties in here in North Florida with a lot of biodiversity, it's, it's fairly easy to find something that, that, that resonates. Yeah, so, good point. Well, thank you so much. Um, I think that uh, Farm Org is going to come back on and, 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 and end this, but uh, thank you so much. It's really been a joy to, to talk to you. So. Thank you so much, Jeff. That was really fun. <laughs> good. Yes, thanks all around. Thank you, Barbara and Jeff. Jeff, for leading this really incredible, insightful conversation. And Barbara, to you for the wonderful tools that you give to the community. These books are really important to, to other activists and helping us spread the message and do more for animals. So we thank you so, so much for being with us. I'm gonna add in the chat um, a link to more information about Animals Best Friends. Um, if you'd like to learn more about the book, um, and of course, to all of you, thank you all so much for attending. A recording of this event will be available on our website early next month. And I'll give you the link to that as well. 
Um, and in the meantime, you're welcome to visit this link and um, see past recordings of uh, Sanctuary Speaker Series that we've put together. Um, Farm Sanctuary is also celebrating our 35th anniversary this year, so you can get more information on our website on the power of sanctuary. Again, thank you all for attending and have a wonderful evening. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye, Thanks again.